right. We are going live. I gotta change this. set. All right. Well, here we go. Well, hello, everyone. I, uh, I'm looking forward to having this conversation tonight. And we're going to go ahead and start by talking a little bit about <clears throat> the software developer compensation. Now, let me go ahead toggle over to a little tweet. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and skip it for now. So one of the things that inspired it, uh, inspired this conversation here, is we went ahead, uh, my voice is a little low. All right. Let me go ahead and do a little bit of gain on that. Okay. How's that? Is that better? Okay. Still too low? Okay. Looks like that's good. All right. So let me start over here. So one of the things that inspired me to want to talk about this conversation is we just recently had a, um, we went ahead and put out a job on Upwork to go ahead and try to hire uh, some developers to go ahead and work on a uh, small line of business application for us. It was basically intended to um, kind of build a little KPI system for us to kind of measure uh, how our marketing and product and sales sort of performance all kind of correlate together over a long period of time. Uh, now, it's not something that we've uh, had a lot of um, had a lot of experience doing historically. We've had some rough KPIs that we, that we follow, such as the size of our mailing list. Uh, but that's that's really kind of about it. Um, so this is not a super high value project for us. Um, we we're not trying, you know, we're not trying to go ahead and launch the next big uh, e-commerce sensation or something like that. This is like a, an internal line of business application. In fact, the way we spec it, this application doesn't even have a front end. It was just supposed to go ahead and produce time series data. Uh, that would be read into Grafana and used to go ahead and let our marketing people uh, go ahead. My music volume's got turned down. Okay, let's do that. All right, and then let me go ahead, try adjusting my gain here. Nope, that all looks good. Okay. All right, sorry about that. I had to turn the music down. Long story short, we got some crazy ass uh, submissions back for this project that we we're working on. And I wanted to go ahead and actually have a little conversation about software developer compensation because we got offers back for like $120 an hour to go ahead and work on something that probably shouldn't cost more than a, like four or $5,000 to go ahead and build. Uh, I eventually ended up taking the Upwork listing down. It was actually our screw up to some extent. We should have priced the job differently. We should have probably done it at a fixed price. We would have gotten the types of offers we wanted. Um, but the submissions we were getting were completely devoid from any sort of reality. here. So I wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit about developer compensation in the context of why uh, I, on um, let's say the, you know, I, I basically work both sides of the table here. Uh, our company, Petabridge, is in the business of selling uh, support, training, consulting to uh, really large customers. We have a lot of customers in spaces like uh, wealth management, uh, banking, uh, you know, doing automated clearinghouse type stuff, insurance, uh, medicine, uh, transportation, logistics, that type of thing. 
So we sell them uh, consulting and support services. And then we in turn, you know, I, I have a team of developers who, who work with us and I'm always looking to try to find a good hire if I can. But this most recent experience uh, made me think that um, a lot of what happens particularly on an open market like Upwork is basically just bulk applying. And I had to go ahead and, you know, I, I kind of anticipate that to some extent, but some of the uh, offers that were made to me off of Upwork were um, definitely way out of line with what the value of this particular service is going to be. So I wanted to talk a little bit about from both sides of the table, uh, why do employers reject offers? So if you want to go ahead and try to maximize your compensation, what do you have to do uh, to go ahead and do that? And the answer is you really need to think about reducing your counterparty risk. Uh, so counterparty risk is a, is a finance term. Uh, it happens in trading, banking, all sorts of different industries. Uh, but it's, it's a generic term for what is the risk of the other party on the other side of the table completely failing to hold up their end of a contract. And this represents typically a fairly catastrophic failure. So for an employer, the um, big risk that we have here is that in the event that a developer we hire costs a lot of money up front and you know basically promises us the moon but ends up ultimately uh completely shitting the bed we're going to end up having to go ahead and redo all that work we're going to lose all the time and we're going to lose the upfront development costs so coming in with a really high offer is really going to go ahead and essentially introduce a high propensity for counterparty risk without doing some things to help reduce that risk, which is what we're going to talk about next. Finally, I'm going to spend a little bit of time of if you want to go ahead and try to command a higher level of compensation, what do you have to do to do that? What are some of the things you can do to go ahead and try to improve your bona fides uh, and also reduce your risk while you're at it? So let's go ahead and start with the first little bit. Why do employers reject offers? So the difference between, let's say, a lot of uh, stakeholders inside a, a company that are trying to hire developers is that these people typically own uh, either products or business units or development teams. And ideally, these people are very mindful of risk and uncertainty. Um, developers like to talk about you're living in a world with no delivery timelines and all that stuff. And let me just say that's, uh, that's a fantasy. Uh, the way the real world works is customers need to be able to be given expectations that they can go ahead and plan around. Therefore, deadlines are real uh, and most businesses are, are going to have them. If you're in an environment where you don't have them, good for you. That's great. But risk is something that employers have to be mindful of and they have to find a way to meet those expectations, deadlines. They have to find a way to stay inside budget. And so those are the parameters that shape the decision-making that an employer is going to engage in. So I take a look at, um, by the way, this applies just as much for full-time hiring as it does for contracting. I take a look at my input costs when I'm thinking about hiring somebody. The first is their compensation. Uh, what is the dollar amount I have to pay this person? And by the way, that compensation um, also includes some things that are not compensation, such as if I'm hiring a full-time person, I also have payroll taxes on top of that. I have benefits. I have, uh, let's say, licenses and seats I have to buy for that person uh, that basically allow them to be productive inside our company. So there's a uh, compensation. I'm kind of just lumping that all together into one figure right here, but that's like the total cost of ownership of uh, having one person in that chair given what their offer is on salary and everything else. And the second input cost and this often gets overlooked, is management overhead. What does it cost to manage this person and help them uh, succeed in their goals? So ideally, an expensive senior developer should require very little management overhead. Uh, it's not the first rodeo. They kind of know uh, how to navigate uh, complex pieces of software. Uh, they know what questions to ask. They know how to keep meetings short. Uh, they don't need a lot of training, that type of stuff. So someone who's more expensive should have uh, an inversely correlated degree of management overhead. Now here's the nasty part, which is counterparty risks. Uh, the number one reason why people don't get hired usually isn't compensation, like asking for too much money. It's usually that they didn't do enough to reduce their, their perceived counterparty risk. So 
the two big areas in counterparty risk are basically dealing with errors. So the criticality of errors. This means if you screw up, how severe of a screw up is it? Uh, one of the famous sayings, I think it's from Andy Grove, one of the founders of Intel, is keep your mistakes small. That applies to individual software developers as well. You know, breaking the build and having the CI system not be able to deploy, not the end of the world. That's probably all right. You're going to get away with that. Um, successfully rolling out an update to production, that completely annihilates the e-commerce system and creates an actual live business stoppage that impacts users. Uh, you have created a massive liability for your employer when you do that. Developers who are typically really, really good at their job and every now and then in their career, they make one giant error, you're probably gonna be all right. That's that's probably gonna be okay. Um, they're probably gonna end up you know, saying, okay, this is someone who's done a lot of great work for us over the years, doesn't make mistakes very often, but this one time uh, there was a, a weakness in our business process around how we do deployments that allow this to happen. We're gonna go ahead and have that developer work with our DevOps team to improve it and we'll get around it. So even making a critical mistake every now and then, is not the end of the world. However, developers who frequently make critical mistakes need to be fired. They have to be thrown out of the organization because you can't trust the quality of what they do. There's something deficient in the way they are doing their job. So people who make, um, people who tend to go ahead and make, let's say like pretty frequent uh, big mistakes are gonna be shown the door and they should be shown the door. It's the right thing for the employer to do. And this brings us to the, um, this brings us to the last bit down here which is the do-over cost. If I bring someone in off the street to do some work for us and they are a screw up or they're not able to deliver it or there's some other, let's say failure risk involved. Maybe they just, they lied on their resume and they actually don't know how to do it. They said they did. Um, we had to fire that person. We have to go ahead and do it over. And that's gonna go ahead and co cause us to go and retask a bunch of other resources uh, we're probably gonna have to throw their code away we're gonna lose a lot of time and this might destroy our budget and deadline expectations we've set with people that's a gigantic failure and this is what employers really want to avoid is having to do do over cost because um it would be cheaper for us just to build it ourselves in the first place with the resources we already have than hire someone else to go and do this so that's what employers like me are, are really mindful of is all of these inputs and out, all these inputs and their risks. This is like all the cost column right here. Now on the output side, uh, in terms of how we assess risk, we have to take a look at the rewards. Uh, what's the present value of the software output? So if a developer successfully does their job and you know, let's say the quality of work isn't necessarily you know, superb, but it meets the, meets the goals. What's the present value of this of this software? What business value measured in dollars is it going to produce today? Next, we have the future value of the software output. It's a good example. If I hire a developer to go ahead and build, let's say, a, a totally new product for us that we've never um, never put in front of a customer before, the present value of that software output is probably going to be pretty low because we have there's a lot of uncertainty around the market, and none of that is inside the developer's control. So the factor I'm going to go ahead and adjust in my you know, mental formula for, for hire or no hire here, I'm going to go ahead and adjust the future value of that software output, which is, yeah, you know, we've done our market research. We have a rough idea of how big this market's going to be. We have a rough idea of what it's going to cost to go ahead and adopt customers to use this platform. We know there's going to be a lot of stuff we don't know about how well this is going to perform once it first gets introduced to the market, but we're going to do our best, right? So. That's gonna be one of the things we're gonna go ahead and try to address as, as part of this. Finally, there's also the benefit of skill development for the software developer. The idea being that the person who is working with us and is learning uh, how our architecture works, how our domain works, and how some of our other processes and tools work, that person's gonna require um, lower training overhead and lower management overhead next time because they're going to be more familiar with the environment. So developers uh, are going to be expected to essentially have higher levels of output the longer they're in the organization. And the higher level output basically comes from the fact that their management costs should go down and the actual delivery time of how quickly they can deliver a solution uh, should basically also decrease, which means their input costs are shrinking.
that's why their output's going up. They're getting more done for less. So these are examples of both like short-term and long-term sort of uh, gains that we're expecting to get from any individual hiring decision. So the formula that I've basically put together for this, and by the way, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a scientist, so I'll probably get laughed at for this. But this is my sort of, uh, this is my risk reward ratio that I do in my head uh, for whether or not any individual hiring decision is worthwhile. So on the top are our outputs, on the bottom are inputs. And so what I'm looking for is I wanna have an H value that is greater than zero, greater than one. This means that I think my reward will be greater than my risk and my costs. So just to recap, my input costs are compensation plus management overhead plus the criticality of errors times their frequency plus the do-over cost. So this is this sort of port. So where you're probably going to get a no hire decision uh, almost always isn't going to be your compensation. It's going to be these other factors on the right. If I'm very convinced that you don't require much management overhead and your likelihood of producing a total disaster that has to be redone by our team is fairly low, I'm probably going to be you know, happier paying you more than taking a total risk on somebody who is not a proven quantity in my, in my eyes here. Uh, so essentially the area we want to really go ahead and try to work on for our purposes of this conversation tonight is reducing these factors. That's what you want to work on. That way you can keep this factor nice and high. And that's what you want. That's what matters to you as a developer. Now, on the uh, output side, you basically don't really have a lot of control over develop uh, as a developer over what the uh, present value of the software is. The only way you can really affect that is by, uh, from an architectural point of view, being able to go ahead and make sure you deliver a solution to market relatively quickly that has the ability to be changed rapidly on the fly. By doing that, you can actually go ahead and improve the both current value and the future value of that system as iteration cost becomes cheaper and it becomes easier to go ahead and deploy the next version of the software. So that's something else you can go ahead and do. Plus, uh, skilling up is always good. You can always go ahead and do that. So this is the risk formula. And like I said, where developers usually don't get the higher decision from me, is that they come in with a high asking price, you know, wanting you know, 100 plus bucks an hour, and they've done nothing to reduce risk. So I take a look at it and I just immediately throw those in the discard pile where it's like, I've got, this looks like a great way for me to burn a pile of cash really fast. So like I said, when you do things to reduce risk, I'm totally open to it. Um, I'm open to going and working with people I trust. I'm working with people who build a credible case, why they should be paid what they're paid. But if you don't do anything to reduce risk, you can't make that case. Uh, next reason why I don't hire. When I put a job description or a, uh, let's say an, a job up on Upwork or whatever, if you bulk apply to it or an agency applied on your behalf, that goes in the discard pile immediately. Uh, because it means the data I'm getting back from you from our screening questions and everything else that like we intentionally put there to try to learn more about our applicants, it means that data is worthless. So I am getting zero, I'm getting all noise and no signal. So that's the first reason why I'd probably go ahead and throw a lot of that data out. The other reason is someone who's going to go ahead and just blow through job applications uh, without necessarily stopping to go ahead and ask uh, questions or be curious about what we're doing or really read the props prompts uh, that tends to indicate this person's going to require a lot of management overhead i'm going to have to spend a lot of time drafting uh, specifications they're going to have to be more detailed than they would be for maybe someone who might be a little bit more experienced uh, i'm going to have to spend a lot of time reviewing the quality of their work and by the way like the worst thing you can do for me specifically is drive up my management costs I'm spread pretty thin on all the things we have to do uh, at our business all the time anyway. Um, the last thing I want to do is hire somebody, start paying them a bunch of money, and then also have to spend a lot of time uh, managing and training them too. Uh, there has to be a cap on how much of how much of that uh, gets gets spent in order for us to realize some value out of, out of each individual person we hire. Uh, now, next thing, did not or allay or reduce failure risk. So didn't do anything to go ahead and make me feel like this person could successfully deliver uh, the product. 
So even for a cheap developer, like we got some offers, uh, like I mentioned, we got some that were in the $120 range, but we got some that were in the $10 range too. Uh, I ultimately didn't hire anybody for this project because I didn't get the impression that the failure risk was low for anybody in there. Now I actually got a couple offers, I should, I should point out. I actually did get a couple offers from people I found to be very credible. They were a little bit out of my price range. It's no fault of their own. It just wasn't the right fit for this job. Uh, they're, they're someone I'd probably want to bring in on a much more mission critical project that's a lot more valuable. On a back end job like this, what I really should have done is I should have set a fixed price and kind of said, all right, anyone who can do it for this much, uh, that would have been a better way of doing it. But, but because I wasn't sure what the actual total development cost was, um, I, I wasn't 100% clear on that. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead, get rid of that. Okay. So, um, next thing I wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit about here is, let's see, oh yeah, time lost and do over costs are too high. So this is the worst thing you can do to go ahead and try and apply for a job is not send signals to me that make me think that, um, kind of with this, make me believe I'm not going to have to haul one of my own software developers off of something they're doing and make them redo this job. That's, that's really what I really want to be convinced. I can't tell you the number of projects I've been in where I spent a lot of money on somebody who had very impressive bona fides, but ultimately wasn't able to cut the mustard. And I ended up having to either you know, work late and make back the money I personally lost and also still do the work myself. Uh, this is ultimately what I really want to avoid. And that's the biggest reason why I, I didn't really hire anybody because I didn't get um, people who I felt could do the job or were too expensive, even what the job's value was. The people who were bidding at the, sort of the right price range didn't really allay or reduce failure risk. So let's go ahead and talk about what we can do to reduce the employer's counterparty risk. If you want to get, you know, get the job offers, you want to go ahead and get the maximum possible compensation, this is what you have to focus on. So, the first thing you should do to reduce your risk is screen for jobs you actually want to do. Don't bulk apply for stuff. Go ahead and be selective and look at jobs that are either going to help you upskill, meaning they take something you're already interested in doing and are already passionate about and will help you go deeper on it than you are right now. That's a great that's a great type of job to look for. Um, and go ahead and assume when you interact with, let's say, the job listing on Upwork, or maybe you're applying for a full-time job through a site like Indeed or something like that, go ahead and assume that your comments will eventually make their way to someone with detailed domain knowledge. Um, now, even if, let's say, there's a technical recruiter sitting between you and the hiring manager, I guarantee you, if you ask some thoughtful questions and say, hey, have you considered doing doing this, or I've worked on this type of system before and I'm really passionate about solving some of these problems. You don't have to write, you know, an essay on this stuff. But sending a signal that you are someone who's got a special interest in this particular position or this project will very quickly separate you from the rest of the pack. That's a very helpful thing you can do. You'll also spend a lot less time uh, churning, churning through potential jobs, by the way. Um, I would say focus on the ones you think you will be successful at doing and the ones you actually really want to do uh, for the sake of, let's say, the job's details itself. Now, I know there's a lot of jobs out there that uh, you might do just because it pays well and um, you, know, you just kind of need the, need the cash. That's fine, too. In that case, I would recommend sticking to jobs where you have sufficient domain expertise to deliver a solution quickly. This is another way of reducing your risk. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we hired um, a developer on Upwork, maybe, uh, might've been two or three years ago. Uh, it was a DevOps developer who was really specialized on technologies that I don't know anything about, like Puppet and um, uh, Salt and uh, Terraform. And we needed someone who could go ahead and basically help us uh, programmatically synthesize new Team City build agent images on Windows Azure. Uh, because we were running into problems with all the new versions of .NET Core coming out, where those images were frequently out of date, were broken by underlying changes to the way the VM runtime worked, and yada, yada, yada. So I found a developer who was uh, 
uh, very skilled at doing all those things. And he was from, from Russia. Uh, and he was, I would say for the Russian market, relatively expensive. But he was able to knock out a great solution, ask really good questions very quickly. I got a, a great signal that this, this guy would be someone who could turn this project around uh, in a very low risk and quick way for us. And it's because, you know, this probably wasn't the most interesting job in the world for him, but he was able to go ahead and basically say, you know, I've been doing this for, you know, five years. I know um, the ins and outs of these technologies. I use them every day for work. I'm just hoping to make a little bit of money on the side here. Uh, and so he got the job. I actually ended up using him twice uh, for two jobs. Now, we, we actually use Azure Pipelines now, so I haven't needed to use uh, that script he wrote in uh, quite a while, but solved a great problem for us and was well worth the money. Um, so by sticking with sort of exactly what your wheelhouse is and being very level-headed about what you promise, uh, I promise that'll go a lot further because ultimately the hiring manager is going to be able to see if you're bullshitting them or not. Um, so I would strongly recommend don't overpromise on anything you, you do to go ahead and, uh, and when you communicate with a potential hirer. Uh, next, yeah, like I mentioned here, stick to your strengths in your resume and profile. Don't list every technology you've ever worked with because it, it becomes impossible for me to sort out what you're actually good at. So, for instance, um, you know, I've been, over the course of my career, I've been a, you know, I've done a lot of work with ASP.NET MBC. I did a lot of work with Apache Cassandra. I did a lot of work with C++. I've done work with Visual Basic and ASP, you know, a, uh, the ASP MBC and um, ASP Classic. I don't list most of that stuff in my resume because for the past five or six years, I've touched relatively little of that. And so I don't want to, you know, mislead uh, someone who might come and hire us by saying, oh yeah, I'm an ASP.NET Core developer, even though all I've really used it for is building a couple of demo applications. I don't really have that deep domain knowledge to be able to, to claim that and that and also this is doubly true back you know seven years ago i could definitely claim that i you know was a fairly robust front-end developer my front-end skills are totally atrophied i haven't learned anything new since knockout js in that department i would never put that in my resume so what i would put is what i'm good at you know i'm really good at aka.net i'm good at dealing with concurrency problems i'm really good at dealing with sockets i know how to work um with all sorts of high performance sort of C sharp constructs, and I'm pretty good at you know project management, architecture, and that type of thing. So sticking to your strengths in your resume and your profile will ultimately help give a clearer signal to developers of like where do you fit in the organization. Because not everybody, some developers, um, some organizations want you know a one size fits all developer who can you know, be a Swiss Army knife and fit into lots of different positions. Um, but some developers, sorry, some companies are looking for developers who are going to fit into a very sort of specific skilled position. So I would recommend playing to your strengths. Now, if you do do a lot of work in front end and ASP.NET and SignalR, and you're doing, you know, let's say, I don't know, Azure stuff behind the scenes, then you should definitely list all that. But I see resumes where people are listing, you know, Magento, Perl, uh, Python, Ruby, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, these are all completely different, you know, these are all completely, sta completely different stacks. I don't believe you when you say that you, you know, or have, let's say, production level qualifications and all these. Just because you used Ruby on a project four years ago doesn't mean you're still current with it. So stick to your strengths in your resume and your profile. I guarantee you that'll help you stand out more. And by the way, when you actually get put through a technical screen, you'll be much better prepared to sail through that successfully, uh, as long as you've been you know, very clear about where your strengths are in your profile. Now, the next things you can do to reduce your risk. Uh, before you even get to the job application stage, this is something you should be constantly working on in terms of investing in yourself. So a piece of advice I've been giving to some developers who uh, you know, basically have entered software as kind of like a second career. So they didn't get um, didn't get a degree in it. And by the way, most software developers don't have one. So don't even worry about that. Uh, most of them, if they do have a college degree, is usually in something else. My younger brother is a fantastic, very skilled programmer. He has a history degree. You know? So don't worry about not having a computer science degree. No one cares. What you should work about, uh, what you should uh, worry about is your proof of work, your ability to demonstrate competency in the areas you've chosen. 
So I s sincerely believe the best way of doing this is to maintain an active GitHub profile. There's no better substitute than this. I can see uh, what types of things you're interested in as an employer. I can see uh, what sorts of things you contribute, what types of work you do. I can go ahead and see you know, what you're, whether or not you're able to go ahead and contribute to someone else's project or maintain your own. Um, you don't have to, you know, create a project that has several thousand stars on GitHub to be able to make a really impressive uh, GitHub profile. All you have to do is just consistently show up, uh, demonstrate what you are good at and what you're passionate about. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to you know, write a commit every day or anything like that. Uh, but just having some body of work that a developer can take a look at and something that you actually include as part of your resume. I promise will definitely help separate you from the pack. Now, one problem that does come up for a lot of corporate developers, uh, these are people who, you know, already have a job uh, and they're working usually for uh, a large company that has, uh, that exercises a lot of control over uh, what they are able to do uh, with the code they write. One of the things that um, is difficult about that is it's actually a lot harder to prove your work because, you know, you might have a family uh, might not be so you may not have all that time to go ahead and maintain an active github profile it happens uh, or the actual work you spend your day job doing uh, you don't really have any easy way of proving that you even did it um, because it's all hidden behind a corporate firewall somewhere or you're under uh, an nda or whatever the next best thing i can recommend that you try to do is to the best of your ability try to write case studies or post-mortems about some of the problems you ran into. Uh, now you can you know, anonymize some of the details if you wish, or blog about it years later, and go ahead and you know try to put this up on your blog. But what this demonstrates is really valuable experience of things you've actually learned by being proven in the field. Uh, and this will carry you a lot further than let's say just linking to a website that you've built. I've had people link me to websites that I know, you know, a major firm like Accenture built and Accenture is not in their, you know, bio at all. So I know that's bullshit when I'm looking at it. So the linking to websites you've built, I understand the attraction there as a proof of work. Only do that if you can prove that you did it. So ways you can prove that you did it uh, would be having some sort of, let's say, comment in some of the javascript files that are up on the site on your front end that'd be one way of doing it if it's a website you fully own and operate go ahead and list yourself on the team page you know you have full control over it so go ahead and do that um, or the other way you could potentially do it is introduce uh, if you get this far in the hiring process uh, go ahead and introduce the people you built the site for to your prospective hirer this this is more appropriate for things like upwork for instance uh, where you're actually trying to apply for like a contracting job but I've had people lie about all sorts of crap on their resumes uh, before, including their level of education, uh, including their you know, past compensation, uh, and things that were fairly easy to go ahead and, and verify. Um, so people will lie about incredible stuff. And as a result, this linking to websites they built signal, I find is fairly weak uh, compared to these other ones because I can't necessarily correlate your identity with what I'm seeing on the browser. Not to mention if it's a big enough system, I have no idea what your hand in it was. Maybe you were the official emoji artist for this website or something. I have no idea. So I would be a little cautious about recommending that. You're better off in this case, if you worked on let's say a really big software project, you might be better off going down the proof of knowledge route. Maintain a blog or a YouTube channel and talk a bit about what your experience has been on some of these big projects. So go ahead and talk a bit about uh, what you learned while you're working on that website or talk a bit about things you learned not to do or uh, maybe you, you compared multiple frameworks or multiple databases to each other as part of like an evaluation process for deciding uh, what you're going to use in a new project there. All that experience is really helpful and demonstrates a degree of, let's say, thoughtfulness that helps reduce risk. It helps sort of uh, establish your ability to reason about trade-offs which is something that very few developers, in my experience, uh, do very well. Um, so being able to go ahead and, and basically even have that conversation with yourself on a YouTube channel or on a blog, 
uh, helps demonstrate a level of, let's say, reasoning and a curiosity about what you're working on that'll help reduce your risk profile. Uh, being active on technical social media, I think is another good one. Um, so obviously, uh, I've got a brand new Twitch stream here with open source production values. Uh, we're gonna work on improving that. But um, being active on technical social media is another good way to kind of go ahead and establish your knowledge. Uh, one thing I've recently seen a lot of people doing on .NET Twitter, for instance, is a number of different developers tweeting out little images showing like a C-sharp blurb and then showing some performance numbers demonstrating that this was more performant than that, etc. So that's also pretty useful, uh, being able to go ahead and, and do some of that behind the scenes. That helps demonstrate that, um, you know, that you've got a, uh, you know, basically a grasp on what's going on inside your ecosystem and work you're trying to do. However, proof of knowledge is a much weaker uh, way of de-risking than proof of work is. So being able to show something you've done is always more convincing than talking about what you did. So that's why I strongly urge people to, to work on proof of work. And I particularly urge it for people who are early in their careers. So building up a really nice GitHub profile where you demonstrate sort of where your interests are and what you're learning how to do, I think will get you a lot further than maintaining, let's say, um, an, an active Twitter account will necessarily. Although you can do both. Um, I you personally, for, from my point of view, you know, I maintain uh, Pettibridge's YouTube channel. I'm about to launch a, a personal one for, for myself. I maintain the Pettibridge blog and my personal one. And I'm also pretty active on technical social media. Um, but I also, you know, my body of work is overwhelmingly, it's all out on GitHub. Um, one of the other ways I guess you could do proof of knowledge is also uh, appearing on other people's podcasts and uh, on tech conferences, that, that sort of thing. But if you're not someone who's, who's all that comfortable getting in front of a crowd, uh, that might be that might be a little intimidating. So you might be better off using a long form medium like a blog, for instance. That might be a better way to go. Now, the last thing you can do to try to go ahead and reduce your counterparty risk to an employer is social proof. And social proof, by the way, will get you pretty far. This is otherwise known as going through the back door for a job rather than going through the front door. So one thing you can do to offer some social proof. So if you have to go through the front door, one thing you can do is offer, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> one thing you can do is offer what's called a blind referral. This means there's a, there's a mechanism by which you can do this on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't remember how to do it, but long story short, <clears throat> you can allow me to go ahead and look through your contacts on LinkedIn, find <clears throat> other people who worked at places you worked, and I can go ahead and I get to pick who I contact those organizations to ask about whether they would positively or negatively refer you or not. That's much more powerful than you giving me people I can talk to because I know you've pre-screened people that are going to give you a good, a good referral. Finding someone <clears throat> randomly in a previous company you worked with who gives me a good referral says, okay, this developer uh, must have been pretty good at what they did. All right, perfect. That's fantastic. However, the strongest way to leverage social proof is applying for jobs through your friends and colleagues. Uh, at my last company before Pettibridge, my absolute two best hires were, actually my three best hires, were all engineers who had worked with someone else who I trusted. And so uh, I ended up with, let's say, a very capable cloud architect. I ended up with a really good front-end developer and a really good back-end developer out of that. So <clears throat> applying for jobs through your friends and colleagues will get you really far. Now, you know, if you're asking yourself, it's like, well, <clears throat> you know, I'm just getting started. I'm relatively new, or maybe I'm, um, I don't have a lot of colleagues in my, in my industry for whatever reason. Uh, what can I do to go ahead and get some? This is a great argument for getting involved with your local meetup groups or for whatever technology you're interested in, whether it's .NET or Unity 3D or Python or whatever. Uh, that's a good way to go ahead and meet other people who are similarly passionate and are in your area and might know other folks who are hiring. And by the way, show up at those meetings, not necessarily just for networking, but because you actually want to learn what other people are talking about there. I had a chance to do this in Los Angeles when I used to, when I used to live there and when I was in my uh, early 20s. Uh, and it was completely life-changing for me. Uh, I, I ultimately ended up meeting all the people who would help me uh, raise money for my first company and would ultimately come to work for me. So I can't recommend strongly enough uh, trying to go ahead and build a social network of people who 
uh, can recognize your value. And if you're early in your career, the best thing you can do to improve your value is to go ahead and be curious and to, to take some risks and try to go ahead. <clears throat> Oops, hit the wrong button. Try to go ahead and improve your bona fides. So <clears throat> this is where the whole area of like skill development really kind of comes into play here. Um, I find overwhelmingly that most, let's say, technical YouTube channels or people who kind of talk about uh, coaching and uh, getting getting interviews for technical jobs, they tend to really heavily emphasize the technical stuff. Um, now, my take is a little different. I think that it is always very useful to learn new programming skills, uh, to go ahead and build up your muscle in terms of being able to manage issues and do triage on, let's say, like an open source project, for instance. Um, but the really valuable skills, I'm going to go ahead and grab a little highlighter here. The really valuable skills are technical risk management, writing, being able to communicate with non-technical stakeholders. Actually, you know what? It's really all the non-technical ones. These ones and these ones are the ones that I believe are the most valuable. Now, why do I say that? <clears throat> well, we've talked about in this conversation from a hiring point of view, lowering risk is where we want to go. We want to go ahead and try to reduce um, our prospective employer's fear that they might have to do over our work. That's what we're trying to avoid. So how can we strengthen our background and be someone who can confidently communicate with them in a way that'll help them reduce their perceived risk, particularly if we're applying for a job through the front door. Well, technical risk management is one of the strongest things you can bone up on in order to do that. I would recommend doing this a million times over learning a new programming language. And here's why. Technical risk management is all about reasoning about trade-offs in a technical context. And these come up in lot, these technical risks show up in lots of different ways. So I'll go ahead and give you an example um, that I was just dealing with today, in fact. So one technical risk we're evaluating on Akka.net, which is uh, my open source project that I maintain, is we're looking at updating our serialization format for how we persist uh, certain types of data objects. And we're doing this in order to actually reduce future technical risk. But introducing that change might potentially increase current technical risk for our users because by changing that persistence format i might actually make it impossible for any other old data to get read which would be one of those critical catastrophic business failures that we're trying to avoid so being able to spot those and reason about the trade-offs and explain clearly what they are particularly to someone who's let's say a product owner or a development manager will make you immensely valuable inside the organization because they're ultimately going to ask you for a recommendation on what to do, but making them aware of where the risk is, is an extremely valuable signal to those people. So being able to spot those on your own and being able to know how to reason about those trade-offs will make you someone who can basically quickly rise up to the level of like a trusted advisor inside your development group. So that's a really robust skill to go ahead and develop, even though it's not as sexy as learning, I don't know, React or whatever. Learning how to navigate around those questions and how to have that conversation, particularly, by the way, particularly with someone who's a non-technical stakeholder, this will propel you very far into your career if you um, kind of develop that muscle to go ahead and do that. This is kind of more like an architectural skill rather than necessarily a programming and doing code type skill. But you can do this even on fairly small projects. You can go ahead and say, okay, well, if I program this this way, this might consume a lot more memory um, but it'll be a lot faster. Or I can go ahead and design it this way, which will go ahead and use a lot less memory, but it's going to use a lot more cycles to do it. That's not necessarily a risk, but it is a trade-off. So learning how to spot technical risks and talk about those is useful. And you can only do that, by the way, by getting engaged in big enough projects where users are going to assume some risk as a result of adopting new changes. Learning how to read others' code. This helps reduce your management overhead, and that's why it's useful. So developers, I find, are typically better and prefer to write new code versus reading old code. And by the way, that is true even for very experienced software developers. Now, what problem does that create? Well, it means that most, let's be totally frank, 
most projects are severely underdocumented. And by the way, most developers, even if there is documentation, won't read it from my experience. So most developers kind of prefer to reason about a, new, a code base, particularly a legacy one, by trial and error or using IntelliSense if you're in Visual Studio and that type of thing. Learning how to follow the thread of code that someone else wrote, being able to understand what the intent of the previous developer was, and being able to, in your head, fit all these pieces together to kind of understand what the system does today, and being able to do that before you modify it. That will make you someone who does not require a huge amount of management overhead if you do that enough times. You'll be able to be someone who can kind of intuitively reason your way about systems. You can basically take a whole bunch of code and maybe after you know, a week or two, you'll be able to go ahead and draw some flow charts that basically describe, here's how the system somewhat functions today. And so that's a really useful skill to go ahead and develop as well. This will go ahead and, like I said, help reduce your management overhead. Next, on the non-technical side, why would I bother mentioning this on a technical podcast or technical Twitch stream? Well, these non-technical skills like writing and being able to communicate with non-technical stakeholders help communicate what you do and don't understand about the domain and about where the risks might be in the system. Being able to engage in those conversations will separate you from the pack. Most developers, in my opinion, are people who want to have a fairly large amount of structure around a job. They just want to be given a spec they can go and implement without talking to anybody. And they kind of will blindly follow the rules and try to implement whatever they're going to do. That's by and large the way most software developers are in my limited experience. Well, albeit limited, but still, you know, pretty wide experience, I guess. Um, a developer who takes the time to pause and say, well, if your business is trying to accomplish this, why are you doing it this way? And that's the reasoning about business domains part down here. And that's someone who can maybe help the business stakeholders and the other people who control a lot of the, you know, let's say the budget and the product management and that type of thing. You can help use that to go ahead and sell them on your ability to go ahead and be a real partner in the development of this project. Um, because you're actually like trying to learn why am I coding this stuff? Not what to code, but what is but what is the code doing and what's the business value it's trying to generate? This will help you go ahead and improve those outputs potentially inside your system. Finally, being able to go ahead and manage a project. Um, so being able to go ahead and put together, let's say a sprint on, on an open source project where you are the only contributor to it. There's still value in doing that because it helps you understand how to go and sequence work together and which pieces follow what dependency and how you should go ahead and get organized in order to deliver features or bug fixes relatively quickly. Very valuable skill, reduces your management overhead. Even if you're not somebody who plans on managing a team of developers, knowing how to organize your own work will make you valuable. And then finally, business risk management. So this is, uh, in terms of if you're gonna be like a solution architect or a very high level sort of developer someday, when I say high level, I mean you're working much closer to the product rather than closer to the code. And those are the developers that tend to get paid the most, in my humble opinion. Either that or the development managers. Not always true, but generally in broad strokes. If you want to get to that level, this is a thing you got to get real familiar with. Um, so what business risk management looks like is, well, I can make this code change, but this might introduce a consistency problem that might result in customers getting double billed which is a lot worse than, you know, blah, blah, blah. You can go ahead and basically kind of understand how this might impact the business's customers or the suppliers or the other stakeholders in the company. And you can say, maybe we need to refactor some of these requirements because I don't think we've necessarily done our homework around making sure this is less risky for these users of the system. Um, the people who are basically in leadership will really appreciate a developer who uh, understands and gets this because that is very exceptional for the most part. So um, the way to go ahead and get practice doing, let's say writing and communicating is just to go ahead and start blogging, uh, do work on some of those proof of knowledge type stuff. The way to go ahead and get, and basically learn how to do project management, that type of stuff, I would say just go ahead and manage your own open source project. And the way to start reasoning about business domains and understanding business risk management is to go work for a small company. Uh, if you work for a startup, or a uh, relatively small uh, small organization, you're gonna be exposed to a lot more of this type of decision-making than you are as an employee number you know, 100,001 at Microsoft. 
Uh, you're just not going to be exposed to as much of this because there's so many layers of management up above you there. And there's so much more structure to how everything works. But this can still, but learning this skill is something you can bring with you to other jobs one day in the future. So it's very valuable to get some experience doing this and to be able to be comfortable having those conversations. Finally, for all this stuff, the only real way to learn is to learn by doing. So uh, if you want to learn how to read other people's code or how to manage technical risk, the best way to do that is to get involved in a more mature open source project and do it because you're either passionate about that project's mission or because you use it yourself and you want to learn how to modify it to make it do something else or actually start using it inside maybe your own little side project. So that's my spiel on uh, developer salaries and uh, how to ultimately try to improve your value, try to make sure you get more offers accepted. Uh, there's some more uh, sort of bits we could go through potentially on how to go ahead and let's say uh, reduce the risk on a specific contract if you want, but I'll go ahead and save that for another stream.